So uh, this is my first Tug conference, so just a little bit about me, and I'm not going to read all those bullet items to you. Uh, but you should notice a lot of experience with mathematics, teaching mathematics, writing mathematics, and programming. Probably the one thing that might need some explanation there is Sage is an open source version of Mathematica, Maple, Magma, MATLAB. So that's, that's what Sage is, and we'll see some more of Sage in a little bit. Uh, I had a colleague in Trinidad when I was on sabbatical years ago, and he would often say to me, Rob, I never get nervous when I give a math talk. Said, well, why is that? He'd say, I just keep telling myself I know more about what I'm talking about than anybody else in the room. <laughs> I don't think that's the case today. So <laughs> I, maybe I'm a knowledgeable user. I know a, a little bit about a lot of different things, but I'm not an expert in fonts or internationalization. I'm aware of all these things. So uh, the, the problem there is probably the reason we're all here. Make a, a mathematics paper or book look really nice uh, in electronic formats. And that probably would have been true when uh, Knut started tech. That might have been a, a way to describe what he was trying to do. We write mathematics. It's very structured. We have theorems and corollaries and cross-references and references in the back of the book. There's a whole lot of structure to a mathematics book that you wouldn't have in a novel. Uh, sort of one of my itches is to write something once in a source format and get lots of different outputs out. And there are lots of outputs available now, of course. When you do something in HTML, there's a whole lot of neat interactive things, especially for mathematics, that you can embed on an HTML page and make available, say, to a student or a reader. So what I'm trying to do is really abstract away and really do a structured source without presentation and make it easy to turn into lots of different formats and perhaps formats that haven't been invented or imagined yet. So this is joint work with David Farmer, who will be speaking after lunch, uh, and Steve Blood. Michael Dubois is a student of mine who's been doing a lot of the CSS work on this. So when I think of a mathematics paper or a mathematics textbook, I think of it as this tree filled with chapters and sections and subsections and then there's various uh, pieces or components in those larger subdivisions. What I want to describe with XML is the markup that really just does the structure. It doesn't say anything about the kind of presentation you want. And you want to be able to turn that into lots of different output formats. So you want tools that are designed to do that kind of processing. So the conclusion I've eventually come to is that XML describes that tree-like structure very clearly, it's perfect for doing the markup. XML is a really simple specification. So it's just the angle brackets and the attributes. And there's like five reserved characters and quotes really aren't a big problem. So there's not a whole lot to XML, even though it has a bad reputation. XSL is a different story. XSL is the language that you use to transform XML into other formats. And that can take a long time to learn. And that's what I've been doing for the last few years. Uh, it's a temp it, you use templates. It's a declarative language. When you encounter a certain tag, you say what you want to have happen to that. So what I'm arriving at is what's called an XML application. So it's not an app. It's a description of the tags and how all the tags interact with each other. So the the collection of elements and attributes that I'm building. I want to keep those very simple. Uh, I do use abbreviations for very common things. Some of them you will recognize from HTML. Some of them you'll recognize from LaTeX. Some of them you'll recognize from DocBook if you're familiar with that. The, more, the less regularly used uh, elements, spell them out in full since perhaps you don't use those very often. Not too many attributes. And I'm really thinking about authors. So I'm thinking about the people that want to write the content and making it really simple for those people. In the processing, I'm trying to embed a lot of knowledge about how to do things that uh, people who don't know as much as the people in this room might find complicated to do. So one example is how you get math jacks to render material on a page. There's a lot of configuration uh, options that you might want to use. You can accept the defaults, but maybe you want to do something a little bit different. It takes a while to wade through the documentation and figure out what you want. But I take care of all that in the processing step. 
Uh, I could imagine a processing switch where you say you want an archival PDF. And we saw in the earlier talk all the different places you might want to put a fake space, I think after an item label, different places like that. I can very easily go through and make all those kind of changes, have that come out in the LaTeX source that I write out. So that's what I mean by embedding knowledge in the system. Uh, I, I do provide a lot of processing switches. They uh, aren't oh, so much about presentation, but you may want to number your theorems across the entire document. You might want to reset the number per chapter. You might want to reset the number per section. So there are those kinds of options, but you don't put that in your source. That's part of the processing step. I'm writing converters, and I'll show you these two uh, LaTeX and HTML and some other formats right now, and I'm trying to make those usable. So, so I think I've said quite a bit of this already in the last slide. Uh, there's an example of a place where I find what I'm doing a little easier for an author than perhaps using straight LaTeX cross-references. So it never really dawned on me until I sat down and, and did it, but in tech, you've got cross-references to bibliographic items, you've got cross-references to theorems, you've got cross-references to equations. So I won't have it in the right order, but you're going to do a slash ref, a slash eq ref, and a slash site. And you as the author have to decide, am I referencing a bibliographic item, an equation, or a theorem? In XML, I can, I can figure out what you're cross-referencing. So I can look at that string there that I've just read as uh, a label in, in what I call an XREF, and I can figure out what that is. And then I can translate that in the case of the text source to the right sort of thing. Having said I'm not doing presentation, I am not trying to do mathematics semantically. <laughs> so I think that has been a downfall of some similar projects, is to try and express the mathematics. LaTeX is super between the dollar signs, and, and everybody knows it. So you just write that stuff the way you're used to, and that's going to bleed through in the right ways in the various outputs. You can define all your macros one time. And, and I'm thinking of short little things, things like notation, uh, how you, what, what you want to use for the real numbers, different things of that sort. So you can put those in once. They'll, they'll do the right thing in your LaTeX source. That's easy. They'll do the right thing for MathJax. They'll do the right thing in an asymptote diagram. They migrate to the right places and, and behave properly. So you can keep all your notation consistent. Uh, everybody wants the ampersand, right? So if you think about LaTeX and alignments and matrices, and if you think about XML or HTML, everybody wants to. You've got to be kind of careful about the ampersand, but that's really the only place where I don't think I've, I've made it sort of straightforward. MathJax defines slash LT and slash GT sort of out of the box. So I just define those in the LaTeX source, and that's what you should use in your mathematics rather than the single characters for this. So I'm not thinking of the XML as being the kind of thing that an archivist would get excited about. I'm thinking about the kind of thing an author will get excited about. Maybe, maybe archivists can add to it or, or do something like that. Uh, so I think my conversion to LaTeX is, is not going to surprise anybody what's going on there. I think of that as sort of the money back guarantee for somebody who says, well, I'm not sure I want to do this this way. Is this going to fly? You're going to get really clean LaTeX out, and you can take that and run with it. Or you can edit it for a journal article to meet whatever particular little needs a journal might have. What I am doing is trying to make the body of the LaTeX between the begin and end document very, very clean, something you could pull out and use with some other style file and have good success with that, and put all the things about numbering and all that kind of stuff up in the uh, preamble. I'm trying to support an internationalization. I don't know as much as Paolo does, but I'm going to learn. So HTML, as much as possible, I'm writing out HTML that can be styled with CSS, but I have to do certain things like write equation 4.6 out in the HTML because the HTML is not going to do that for me. Uh, I've gone to great lengths to make sure that however you write your source and whatever processing switches you set, if you get 4.6 out of the LaTeX because of how the preamble gets written, you're going to get 4.6 showing up in the HTML by how I'm converting it. So the two should match up that way. 
pull a lot of stuff from a lot of places. Fonts come from Google. Syntax highlighting for code snippets comes from Google. Uh, putting in various interactive elements. I'll show you what the Sage cell is. Uh, program listings are not interactive, but that's something that uh, is a little different than straight tech. Uh, and there's some other things. Sculpt is in your browser Python. So the whole Python deal happens inside your browser. WebRTC, you can think of like Skype or something like that. WebWork is a homework system. Trying to do SVG graphics as much as possible so they scale nicely. When you scale the, scale the fonts, MathJax fonts scale nicely, the SVGs scale nicely. You can describe graphics using Tixi. You can use Asymptote, or you can write Sage code whose last line produces an image, and that will all get picked up. Have to process all that stuff with a little Python script on the side. So I have to pull out those sources, package them up properly, make the images, and put them in the right place. And I think I already talked about that. As much as possible, I, so it, it's taken me a while to figure this out, but with XSL, you can kind of do an object-oriented style programming using mode. And then you can start to do things sort of like polymorphism and abstract methods. If you're familiar with Java, you can sort of write in that style. So I'm trying to generalize as much stuff as I can and sort of pull that into a common file. Uh, just last week, I started converting my sources to Sage worksheets. So this was the very original problem that got me going down this path. Sage, I'll show it to you in a minute. Sage has uh, a web app, for lack of a better name, sort of an interface where you can write text and execute Sage commands. The underlying format of that is mostly HTML. There's a few extra things going on. But now this Sage Notebook, as it's called, it's providing the MathJax configuration. It's doing a few things for you, so you have to make some adjustments to make that happen. So because I've got conversion to HTML working, it's a very small step to convert to what a Sage Notebook expects in the way of HTML. So I did that originally by starting with LaTeX source for my open source linear algebra textbook, and I ran tech for ht against that and got good looking XHTML from that, and then I would rip out the little bits and pieces that I didn't need and package that up as a Sage worksheet. So that worked, but it was a little bit brittle. I can do that now with just 200 lines of the XSL language to get the right output that the notebook expects, and then it's about 200 lines of Python to package a whole book up as a zip file and put all the graphics files in the right places for managing that format. So I'll go to some demonstrations. Uh, the one thing I should explain down there before I show you stuff is Sage doc tests. So we heard about testing earlier. Sage has a really comprehensive test suite. Uh, you write Sage code, you write the text output you expect, and that gets run on lots of different architectures, gets run repeatedly. So when I put Sage code into a textbook, I also put the expected output and I can create a doc test file that I can run Sage on. So let's show you a few things. So this is, I, I helped Tom Judson with his open source abstract algebra textbook. And this is sort of the front page or the title page, the table of contents. I'm gonna show you permutation groups over and over again. So chapter five, permutation groups, you know, and that's all math jacks that you see there. And there's not, that's sort of an introduction to the chapter and the chapter's got some subsections. So we'll go into 5.1. So we're in a browser here, Rob? Like yes, here, yes, we're in Firefox and, uh, yeah. you know, oh. wow. and, and maybe I'll put it like that. Um, and I'm doing it locally just because yeah, I'm yeah, up yeah. here, but yeah, you can, you can do it. Uh, you know, we're pulling the fonts from Google. The CSS is coming from the American Institute of Mathematics. Oh, it's coming from all over the place. Uh -huh. yeah. That's why I emailed you and told you I needed internet. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. So, uh, I mean, there, there's no big surprises here. Uh, tables are on my to-do list, of course. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I'm getting, uh, I'm separating a header from a body, but I don't have the vertical lines for the other side of that Cayley table yet. So that's, that's on the to-do. There's not a lot left on the to-do list. Uh, so what I want to show you is, let me just grab this over there. 
So that's a tick Z diagram originally. So the tick Z source for that that Tom Judson wrote is just inside of a couple of tick Z tags. And my Python script rips that out, wraps it with standalone and various goodies, makes a PDF, and then it, uh, PD, I'm using PDF to SVG. I know there's another tool that'll do a DBI to SVG. And, but all that's a Python script, and you don't have to know how to do that. You just learn how to use my little script, and you get that. All right. Uh, so I want to show you. So let's go back. So, so Rob. Yes. Go ahead. Uh, so this is the output from your HTML output yeah, back should... end. It's had nothing to do with Lock Hacker. Right. Uh, yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So the source is in the XML that I'm designing. The math is all in between tags, and it's the LaTeX syntax you're using. Which to. you're parsing, not Lock Hacker. Uh, no, I mean, I'm just dumping it on the web page and MathJax is that's rendering. Oh, okay. MathJax okay. is doing the rendering on the web page. Uh -huh. uh, the HTML has very little styling, so that so all these menus and and the previous and next buttons, that's my students really yeah, yeah. a lot of CSS. <laughs> and David Farmer's been real active with the CSS. It's all three of us, but. Uh, so I wanted to show you, I've written some stuff about Sage for each chapter. So there's a bunch of stuff here about how to do SAGE with permutation groups. And I thought... So I was in the middle of Tom Judson's abstract algebra textbook, chapter five on permutation groups. So I've written some material about how to use SAGE to either study permutation groups or learn about how to use SAGE. So these are the interactive widgets, for lack of a better name, that you can embed on an HTML page that I'm, that I'm thinking of. This is a project called the SAGE Cell Server. So you've got a small text box there. It's code mirror is the, is the JavaScript widget. And that chunk of code originated in my source with a little bit of state, you know, a little markup that said, here's some Sage input. And when I click this evaluate button, it's that three lines of Sage code is going to a running instance of Sage at the University of Washington that is just waiting for a little chunk of text. And that computation with permutations has come back and there's the 245 that is the output of that computation. Uh, and there are a series of these, and part of the point in doing three of these is that they should be using results or uh, permutations defined in previous cells, so they are chained together. Uh, I could take this permutation, and it was 1-3, I think it was, and now I can make it 1-2. It's editable. I can run that, and somehow I got a problem. So it didn't like, it didn't like I know I have two twos, yeah. <laughs> I didn't think it would be an error, but uh, there, okay. So you can edit examples, and uh, we'll see those again as well. I want to show you one little thing while I'm in this book that uh, David Farmer should so, show more of in the next talk. So I've got to go find it because there aren't many of them. Okay, so there, there are a few footnotes in this book. So right, I don't know if well you can see it, just to the right of that blackboard bold Q is a footnote one. And uh, when you click on that, the page opens up and you get the content of the footnote there. So that's something that uh, David calls a knoll, like the root of knowledge. And if you click on it, you can pack it away. So uh, that's sort of the next step in my processing is to make things like examples and exercises and theorems and solutions and all kinds of bits and pieces, things that you can selectively turn into nulls. That'll improve page load with MathJax. It'll allow you to hide solutions to exercises so that somebody doesn't see the plot spoiler. Lots of neat things you can do with nulls. Citations are probably one of the best examples. So if you see, you know, brackets four, and you click on the null and you get the whole citation and you pack it away. When you go and read paper again, you really don't want to turn to the back to find out what brackets for is anymore after you've done that. Okay. 
So same content, same source. I talked a little bit about building Sage worksheets. So this is what's called the Sage Notebook. So I'm doing this uh, not locally. This is residing on a different server at the University of Washington. It's running this thing called the Sage Notebook server. Uh, it, like I said before, it's a web app for lack of a better, better term. So the table of contents is now being managed by the Sage Notebook. And you have these various files here and they're out of order because I've looked at chapter five previously and the sage notebook is should be providing the whole html setup and all that stuff so you can start to see the uh, math jacks being applied so this is the entire chapter so why it's a little bit slow to do that there's that introductory section there's uh there's the tables there's all that stuff and let me scroll down you know the tick to z image is what i'm looking for right now that i go by it uh, there it is. So it's a little bit, it's, it's scaled to fill up the whole width of the page so I could, I could resize my browser if I wanted to take care of that. Uh, but what's going to go on now is those examples that I showed you. Where are those? They're down here. There are those exact same snippets of Sage, and this is the way most people interacted with sage code several years ago and the lots of people continue today now i've got the sage code i'm writing the expected output if you just want to look at it you can go ahead and, and evaluate it that's running again at the university of washington and getting pasted back in as part of the mechanism for the sage notebook there and of course should be giving me all the same results as before so same source slightly different interface to this to the same content uh, I see. So this is also the output from your program. Exactly. Out yes, the it's, it's the same XML source process for a slightly different target, but mostly the HTML is just all being recycled. Mm -hmm. There's just, there's subtle differences. Math is not the XML or something? Or no, the, the, the math is just it's raw LaTeX. It's the it's same. It's the same. No, the kind of math you have here. Like, like that S4 right there? Yeah. That's, that's oh, MathJax. MathJax is part yeah. of the Sage notebook. So, so. In, the, in your course, it's in XML? No. Right. Take LaTeX, La yeah, or tech, dollar yes. Dollar sign S underscore four dollars. Right, but not dollar <laughs> sign. But I've got different tags <laughs> other than dollar signs, but yes, yeah. yeah but then uh, you, you add some graphics, right? So MathJax is limited in its tech capability, right? So you yes. Really uh, you can do a lot of, I mean, I, the, it, so it supports the whole AMS math. It, MathJack supports a lot of things, not everything. No, but if you have these uh, graphics, like you go down, you have certain graphics. Just the, just the big, just the big Tixi images, those, those sorts of things. But none of the math that you're seeing on this page is graphics. Yeah. It's all, it's all being rendered by MathJax. So graphics package is equal to work, right? Correct. So, Rob, I have another yeah, question. Sure. Sorry. Yes. Right where the cursor is, if you go over to the right a little bit, you see backslash URL. That's a mis Yeah, that's, this, is, this is brand new last week. So you, 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 you've got a keen eye. Yeah, so that's some translation from the tech that has not been cleaned up yet. Perfect, thank you. Thanks for pointing that out. Okay. Uh, all right. So let's get out of that. So this is my text editor, which is Sublime Text. So this is one of the things I produced from the source. This is the doc testing uh, that Sage does. So these are the unit tests, if you will, on the Sage portion of what I've written. So those same three examples that I was stepping through a minute ago, there's the input. The format for the Sage doc test is to write Sage colon in front of inputs. And then the line below without the Sage colon is the expected output. So that's a huge Python doc string that I can process with Sage, and it will tell me every place that some Sage developer has made a change that has impacted the examples that I have put in Tom Judson's book, and then I have an opportunity to fix those. So Sage is always changing, and that's a good way to try and keep the content of the book current. And I do, I do that about every six months, and the changes are usually pretty minor. 
from running all those tests. But the point is I can rip all those individual pieces out of the source and format it the way Sage wants to see it. All right. So here's what my source looks like. All right. So uh, the general reaction is XML, oh, yuck. And if you have looked at machine-generated XML, that's, that's right. So uh, this may look foreign to you. It may feel verbose. Uh, with time, it, it starts to become natural. You start to get used to it. At the top there, I've got a proposition. And the proposition ends down here about two-thirds of the way down the page. The proposition has a statement. The statement includes, could include multiple paragraphs. This only has one. There's a proof of the proposition. There is some multi-line math right down here. So the MD is math display. That's going to turn into a begin end a line on the tech side uh, and on the math jack side. You need the ampersands to align things. And that's, that's the one place where you sort of have to do something a little bit dirty to get all the escape characters to line up. But that's, I think if you look at what I'm showing you right now, that's the only place you're going to see sort of a, uh, a concession to escape characters there. Yes? Uh, I have a question. We yes. Have here for multi-line, we have MD, MRO, and MRO, so on. What happens if I put M and close M, and put inside something of uh, MS map construction, like uh, begin a line, end a line, or something like this? That would probably render just fine. It's not, yeah. That's not the intent. Yeah, maybe, maybe it would be easier to do it this way. Uh, suppose you want to number the third line of your display, but not the other lines. So you can selectively, on each, so why, why mark up the rows? Yes. Yeah. You can selectively number them or not. You can selectively label them or not. You, so if I mark them up in LaTeX, it will not go to your XML on the other way around. Yeah, things like labels and all that are not going to serve. They're not going to survive. From LaTeX, but not from LaTeX. Correct. Very That's the next talk. Ah, okay. <laughs> okay. You know, and, and everybody know it, all of those M rows except the last one get a slash slash, mm -hmm. and the last one does not. Yeah. And that's that's totally trivial. In that's one of the nice things about X, XSL. You say every M row put a slash slash on it. But if you're M row and you're the last M row in a sequence, do it this way. And, and this way would be no slash slash. All of those sort of exceptions are handled. Very, the, way, the way XSL is designed, once you get a feel for it, it's real easy to do those kinds of things. Yes. It's a good segue, but why XSL and not something like Java or Python for, for transforming your XML? You, you could do that, but I mean, X, so XSL is, is these templates. You just you say, when, it, when you see an M row, I mean, I think other than some details about labels and that kind of thing, uh, when you see an M row, basically I just say take all the stuff in there and put a slash slash on the end, like I was just saying. And, and you don't have to plug it into the, there's no logic, there's no flow control. It's yeah, declarative. So, I, I mean, it's easy to make, I find it easy to maintain. Yeah, yeah but, but, you, but you don't have control of the alignment. For, for example, you want to make a good alignment. Well, you can, yeah, but you can throw the ampersands in and let the begin align do it. And it's going to work on the, it's going to work on the latex side and on the, if you're using math jacks, it works fine with math. Ross? There's no um, clashes with math analysis of MRO or anything like that? So I, so I have not done anything with namespaces yet. And maybe I, and maybe I should be. So that's, there's, I told you I do a lot. About, I know a little about a lot of things, and I know that I should probably be more careful about namespaces. Well, I'm start, I've started writing the BTD. I'm about what halfway through that. Who is the author here? Pardon me? What are they, who is this author? Sure. Uh, I use this editor right here. So, so you, you yeah, I guess, yeah. And it's, you could use an XML editor. I found them heavier than I needed, so I just got rid of that M row on the end. And I'm pressing Alt and the period. You know, so if it looks verbose, if you've got a reasonably, you know, and I got a little bit of syntax highlighting here. So this is not an XML editor. It's Sublime Text that is a programmer's editor. And it's, you know, you get, you get used to it. You figure out what's annoying and find the right commands to complete stuff. And it, it gets pretty quick. What's the, what angle 
ankle bracket in right ankle bracket, which somehow sticks in my craw. <laughs> You're not alone. You're not alone. Yeah, yeah. All right. Are there other questions about the ugly stuff? <laughs> okay. It gets better. All right. I've got a couple of uh, slides back on the other side real quickly. Thanks for the questions. And I'll just try and wrap up here. So, and I will do these kind of quickly. So uh, you, you may or may not have noticed that this whole presentation was written technically as an article with no table of contents. I don't have a slideshow mode. Maybe I'm going to make slideshow and frame and some things like that, but I'm not far away from, from that. Uh, I've two summers working on this, nine months of writing a lot of things of my own, so that's where the experience with XML comes. Uh, Tom Judson's book we converted and are going through and finding all the slash URLs and the little things that Carl noticed. And he's starting another book with uh, T.J. Hitchman on ordinary differential equations. I don't have time to show it, but there's a real mature project with Chris Godsell on algebraic graph theory that's not very structured, but tons and tons of sage code in there. That's kind of a fun thing. And there's some other people that I won't mention who've uh, started on things. Oops, sorry. Uh, so these are a few of the things that I have on my list, but if, you know, somebody comes to me and says, I'm writing something and I really need X, Y, Z, uh, that's going to move to the top of the queue. Knowles, I mentioned that I'm partially through a DTD. My linear algebra textbook that started all this is in a one-off XML. That was where I figured a lot of this stuff out. I should be able to convert that fairly cleanly. Uh, lists are sort of functional. Tables, I'm just beginning. I want to build lots of lists, especially for the HTML, a list of definitions, a list of theorems, a uh, list of notation, sort of build all those things automatically without, uh, without you writing anything extra. Sage Math Cloud is an interesting project of William Stein. You get a whole Ubuntu terminal in your, in your web browser that's got everything ready to go, and he's got a slightly different format, so that's the follow-on to the Sage Notebook. IPython is a big project. They have their own JSON format. I can write IPython notebooks, it just it needs to be cleaned up. Uh, EPUB, I'm not sure if I'm serious about writing to Word, but uh, <laughs> maybe that could be done as a nice demonstration. And I'm certainly interested in uh, other possibilities. So it, it, it's not finished, it's in, it's in good shape. I'm using it for books and papers as are other people. And like I say, I wanna be responsive to, to what people need to finish up big projects. That's my first priority. Uh, converters are good shape. I'm starting to, I just started that Sage notebook, notebook converter the other day. So I'm, I'm ready to open new fronts. And there are the URLs where you can go and, and get the links to everything you need. Everything's open, open source, GitHub, everything's available. All right, thank you very much for...